This is Andrea Resendez, and you are watching the Break It Down Show. We have an exciting, exciting story for you today. It's a, it's an odyssey like no other. It's often unknown. So if you know about the story of Cabeza de Vaca, then you know what's about to happen. And if you don't know, Cabeza de Vaca was, well, I want to let Andreas tell you because he can explain this better. So, hey, welcome to the show. This is Friday afternoon. We're here at the Huntington Library in LA. And I love this facility. You're a fellow here doing study on whatever next crazy project that is that you're going to do. And your books are fantastic. Thank you for coming. I'm so excited. Give us some background on Cabeza de Vaca. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, so, um, some general background. So, uh, initially, uh, the crown took control of central Mexico, but then from there it started expanding uh, into other regions. And uh, the way it worked uh, was that uh, men of enterprise in Spain, particularly in Seville, where many of these expeditions departed from, uh, put together uh, companies. Uh, I mean, they were literally called compañas, so that's mm. where the uh, so where the uh, word company came from. Uh, bought horses, weapons, uh, lease ships, and uh, got uh, royal patents of conquest from the crown. And so this particular expedition was for the uh, for the coast of Florida. Uh, so basically, they didn't know exactly uh, what Florida comprised uh, consisted of. Um, so that's where they were going. So that's just the general background. And so. Uh, 300 men around uh, that uh, that number sailed from Spain. They stopped uh, in the large island shared by uh, the Dominican Republic and Haiti called La Isla Española or the Spanish island because it was the one initial island controlled by the Spanish. From there they went to Cuba and uh, there, the first uh, major accident of this expedition, it was a completely disastrous expedition, as you anticipated. Right. Uh, the first major uh, disaster occurred, which is that the, uh, while getting some victuals from the southern shore of Cuba, they got hit by a major hurricane. Now, uh, what's interesting about this is, of course, uh, you know, men from Spain would never have come in contact with something like this. Right. Uh, hurricanes do not occur in the, uh, you know, in the Mediterranean or the Northern uh, uh, Atlantic uh, Ocean because hurricanes require a lot of heat to form. And so they do occur in, uh, you know, in the Pacific where they are called typhoons and they occur in the Caribbean and in the Gulf of Mexico where they are called hurricanes. And so you can imagine that many of the men who experienced this, I mean, Ships were lost, lots of lives were lost. Uh, Cabeza de Vaca says that it was crazy. He had never experienced something like this before. 10 or 12 men had to lock arms in order not to be blown away. And they had to walk around in the tropical environment of Cuba uh, with palm trees falling around, not palm trees, but trees uh, falling around and houses being blown off. And so, of course, uh, many took this as a first omen that this expedition was going to be completely crazy, as it indeed was. Yeah. So, in a hurricane, is this like, how much is this a message from God when this happens for these guys? Because they don't know a hurricane. And then uh, the hurricane is like the gentlest thing that happens. <laughs> like in this trip, it only gets worse from here. Right. Yeah. So, um, so some people uh, decided not to pers not to continue given the circumstances, but the majority continue. I mean, they uh, had negotiated all kinds of deals in Spain. Some of them were going to be, um, uh, you know, occupied positions of importance in the new colony. The idea was to colonize Florida. Mm. Uh, I mean, as crazy as it sounds, 300 men were going to colonize Florida, quote unquote. They were going to establish two forts. They were going to establish towns, um, and they had already negotiated different positions in these towns and forts, etc. So the next problem they had is that they needed to find uh, where this place was. And they wanted to begin by uh, getting to the only settled place uh, in the area, a little town called San Cristóbal del Puerto 
which is in what is now northeastern Mexico in the state of Tamaulipas. So that place had already been colonized by Spanish. There were a handful of Spaniards there and they wanted to go there. But uh, they didn't really have a very good pilot or they didn't have the normal pilot that piloted the earliest uh, Spanish expeditions through the Gulf of Mexico. And so they had to do with, uh, with another pilot. They looked high and low and they uh, found this other pilot, Miruelo. Um, who may have been competent, but he wasn't prepared to understand just the strength of the Gulf Stream, which is the mm -hmm. fastest current in the world, the most powerful current in the world. And so basically uh, he, you know, the, the, the expedition was knocked off course because of this tragic uh, navigational error. Um, and instead of ending up in what is now Northeastern Mexico, they ended up in the surroundings of what is now Tampa Bay uh, in Florida, on the Gulf side of Florida right. uh, Peninsula. Which again, is, it has nothing in it. Nothing in it. Right. Uh, they are a thousand miles away from the closest, from the San Cristóbal del Puerto, and thousands more from Mexico City, which is the only major uh, settlement, Spanish settlement, in anywhere in that region. Uh, but uh, because they were convinced that they had arrived close to Santi Esteban del Puerto, they again overconfident, especially the leader of this expedition was mm -hmm. a uh, red-headed, bearded man, you know, the personification of the conquistador, muscular, tall, etc. Yeah. Panfilo de Narvaez, who uh, on the spur of the moment decided, well, we are going to get all the men down and all the horses and we're going to proceed in two groups. The ships will continue coasting and the men will proceed uh, on shore and we will meet further up by the river of the palm trees as they were called, Rio de las Palmas, uh, which, uh, which is the marker that they knew were close to, but they were a thousand miles from. And so to, to not belabor the point, they, these two uh, parties never met. And so what we have is these 300 men completely stranded very far from any Spanish settlement, etc., cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, and with no means to return to either Cuba or Española, let alone to Spain. And so that's where the whole saga begins. Um, I mean, I don't know how much, if you want to ask me or I can continue. Well, let me, uh, yeah. I just setting some of this stuff. And, and this also goes into a, a thing I like to bring up when we talk about this area. This is like the early 1500s. So the new world is very, very new still. I mean, even the pace of, of information and the things that, you, that takes months and ships get sunk and things are, you know, so it's really hard to really grab the big picture back then. And the other thing is we, we uh, you know, Columbus is a, a, a confounding person, right? Like we all come, you know, things are named after him. You know, species are named Columbian mammoth or whatever over at the Brea Tar Pits, right? But you also have like, oh, my gosh, he did all these things. But when you put it in the context of the time, these folks are clinging on the edge of life. And, and there, isn't, uh, there isn't a textile mill. You know, there's all these things. There's not someone to make rope. You have to make rope yourself. All these things. So talk about like what they go on this um, really a safari. But they weren't prepared to do that. They were just going to walk while the other guys sailed. So what do they have with them to survive I mean, because you're like, oh, well, they have game. It's Florida. There's probably a kangaroo or something, and they can shoot that. But did they bring bows and arrows? Every time you shoot an arrow, you may not get it back. I mean, all of these things. They didn't have bows and arrows. They had uh, firearms. Of okay. Course, you know, 16th century, very clumsy. Mm -hmm. pieces, yeah. Uh, that, and, uh, of course, they, uh, once on the Florida uh, shores, they realized that they were in a totally alien world where there's very little in the way of food, mm. uh, as you anticipated. So they would have seen, for example, uh, alligators, which would have been absolutely creatures, absolutely formidable to the Europeans who have never seen something like that. Right. Um, they really didn't have much to eat there. They depleted their, they had provisions that they had brought along in their ships and they, they were disembarked, uh, but they went through those provisions very quickly. And the only thing they had was if they could catch something, they could fish something, or uh, the heart of some palm trees, uh, they could eat that as mm -hmm. well. Um, but that was about it. Mm -hmm. uh, as uh, you know, they uh, and they had 
tremendous difficulties. For example, many 16th century Spaniards, even though they had embarked on these transatlantic voyage, many of them did not know how to swim. And Florida has a whole bunch of rivers that they yeah. needed to ford, and some of them are really deep. And so they had a problem to crossing all of these rivers, getting all the equipment uh, across, etc. So they are shedding baggage as they are walking through the length, the entire length of Florida, from Tampa Bay all the way to the Florida Panhandle. Yeah, they are running out of food. Some people are dying. Uh, they are despairing at their overbearing captain, uh, who uh, who is thinking, "Okay, we're going to find the, the ships. It's not going to be a problem." Yeah. Um, and uh, they are mostly surviving by uh, preying on indigenous communities that they encounter. They uh, they descend on these communities. Uh, indigenous people flee, and they basically take their corn uh, stores, and that's how they survive, survive right. basically. And so they uh, end up uh, by the Florida Panhandle and they reach a bay uh, that they call the Bay of Horses because at that point they can no longer uh, support that. And they, they still think that they are they must be relatively close to San Esteban del Puerto, but they don't want to continue walking. They have many people ill. And so what they're going to do is that they are going to which is a decision that I uh, suffered as I was writing the book to kind of understand what the mindset of these people must have been, but I mean, yeah. sheer desperation. They are going to uh, kill their horses and eat them. They are going to uh, make forges out of that. They're going to melt their metal objects, including their firearms, which means that they were now at the mercy of the indigenous peoples that they had been stealing from, right? Uh, and that was the only thing that saved them, and that you know that kept them uh, at an advantage over these peoples. Right. They are going to melt those to make crude axes, etc., and they are going to chop down trees in order to make barges so that they can float down the Gulf of Mexico all the way to San Francisco del Puerto. So that's the decision they make. They make five barges. And you know, at that point, there were maybe 200 out of the 300, 250 were still alive. So 50 men per barge. Uh, again, you have to uh, to uh, recognize the ingenuity of these individuals sure. who are chopping down woods. I don't know if you've ever been to that part of Florida, uh, yeah. but I mean, it's just uh, pines. Yeah. Uh, it must have been quite quite a difficult thing to uh, chop dozens of these trees, strip them of all their branches, right. uh, lash them together with uh, the manes and the tails of horses that they are braiding into rope. Wow. Uh, they are using their clothes to fashion makeshift sails. They are putting a dagger board so that they can more or less steer this. Uh -huh. um, and while all of these things are happening, they are killing one or two horses every day to feed the men while they are constructing the, the ships. And when everything, uh, they are fashioning another key point mm. is the water aboard mm. these. Okay. Uh, and so they are curing the legs of the slain horses to make water bottles. Okay. And when everything, and then they are uh, raiding indigenous, nearby indigenous in order to bring the corn aboard the, the barges. And so when everything is ready, they cast off. Um, they somehow navigate. The men uh, are adrift uh, mm -hmm. on the Gulf of Mexico. They cross a what they describe as a huge river in which it is possible to drink fresh water from the ocean, which could only be the Mississippi. So right. They cross the Mississippi. Uh, they are pushed into the into the Gulf of Mexico at that point by the river by the river okay. and by storms storms and, by the, and current, yeah, yeah. And currents uh, they you you would have to imagine that they only had limited maneuverability of these right. uh, these barges um, and all five end up uh, washing up on what is now the coast of Texas and to make a very long story short out of the two hundred and fifty that navigated. Uh, you know, many of the men, uh, you know, were attacked by Indians uh, and killed and did not survive. 
Others try to continue on land, you know, by walking. And right. Then the winter cut them, and they decided to stop for the winter, and they died of starvation over the winter. Um, others, the luckiest ones, arrived on an island off the coast of Texas. And the identity of this island is a matter of much scholarly speculation mm -hmm. of whether it could be Galveston at some point they were thinking, something like that. But it's probably, I mean, the that coast has changed so much in the intervening 500 years sure. because of hurricanes and things like that, right. that it is very difficult to identify that but island. somewhere in the neighborhood of Galveston? Of Galveston, okay. somewhere in that area. You know, islands off the coast of Texas, where they, the Cabeza de Vaca and the roughly 80 men who survived two barges, that the, the remnants of these two barges, uh, so about 80 men, uh, almost at the point of uh, dying, they uh, reach this island, they are taken by the indigenous people. Okay, so let's there. press, I want to press pause at the indigenous yeah. people. So sure. these guys make these, what sound like Huckleberry, you know, Huckleberry Finn uh, rafts. I mean, these lashed. They're not like making timber out of this. Like they're just literally taking the trees, knocking them down, using the horse hair from their dead horses that they turned into dinner into rope. And then they're taking the horse legs to make water vessels. And so uh, they use their clothes to make sails. What is when they're on these rafts and they're in the Galveston area? What do they have left for provisions? And you've, they've lost another 50 or 100 people, it sounds like, too. Sure. No, I mean, at that point, their situation is totally desperate. Mm -hmm. uh, at, that pe at that time, their water bottles have rotted away, mm -hmm. and they are very fearful every time they have to pull ashore in order to get some fresh water because an attack from the Indians at that point could be lethal because they have nothing. They right. are practically naked. Oh my gosh. And uh, winter is approaching and they have nothing um, so uh, except the barges. Uh, so uh, so that's the condition that that they wash up on in. Yeah. Uh, and are these are these like town people who don't know how to survive in such a challenging environment? Or are these uh, I mean, OK, you got some conquistadors and they're you know, they've got a spirit of adventure and they're hardy in there. But. but is everybody like that? I mean, if you bring a cobbler with you to make shoes, like that guy's like, help every 10 seconds, you know? So what's the nature of the people that are there? How adventurous are they? Right, no, that's a great question. So these, as I mentioned, these Florida expedition was meant to colonize the new world. So they obviously brought a cross section of Spanish society, as you, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. So you have everything from men of letters, you know, lawyers, et cetera, uh, to, uh, Cobblers, peasants, yeah. uh, you know, handy people. And that shows, I mean, if they are able to parlay their horses and metal spurs yeah. and swords into forges and nails and axes, right. I mean, they are pretty resourceful. They yeah. are amazing, uh, amazingly resourceful to do that. So clearly they are not, uh, you know, they have some resources, but at the same, by the same token, they are thrown in a completely different world. Mm. They have never, I mean, some of them have lived in the Caribbean, uh, like the leader, Pafilo de Narvaez, who yeah. had been a, you know, a veteran of the conquest of the Caribbean. But uh, the vast majority were people from the Iberian Peninsula. They found the Florida fauna and flora completely alien. They didn't know how, how to hunt yeah. there, what to eat, what was poisonous, what was not. Right. Uh, so they basically were very needy, and uh, to their great fortune, the indigenous peoples of this island, uh, you know, decided to take them in. They actually they have a very touching scene. They said that when the Indians saw us, they wept at our side, that they wept at our misfortune, that we were uh, naked and shipwrecked, and the winter was coming, and mm -hmm. that we had absolutely nothing. Um, and so they, uh, you know, they they took them to their uh, to their settlement. These indigenous peoples on that island were semi-nomadic peoples. Okay. Again, this is a world that they were that the Spanish were ill prepared to understand. So they lived only cyclically on the island, so just for a few months mm -hmm. uh, to spend the winter there. They survived on oysters. There were banks of oysters there, and uh, in the spring, they would move to the mainland. 
and they would collect uh, various plants and berries, and they would hunt bison. Um, but again, all of this would be totally alien to the expeditionaries. There's a beautiful drawing of one bison, uh, which is quite possibly the first drawing of a bison that we have right. from the Spanish. Uh, in uh, so, uh, so clearly, they're learning about their new environment. But basically, out of 80, eventually over the winter, uh, you know, 15 uh, remain. Uh, it also appears that the indigenous people start getting ill, or mm -hmm. so the Spanish report. And the indigenous peoples obviously blame the foreigners for bringing these new uh, illness. And so at some point, they are fearing for their lives. They think that right. they're all going to be sacrificed. But they are spared, and eventually only four survive. OK, I just. Because this is the, it, it's so crazy. So I want to do two things before we get too much further into how many survive. But I want you to come right back to that and do with math for us. But uh, what are your source materials? It's as if you're walking with these people. And I know we're here at the Huntington where they have an unbelievable archive of things. So you've read these reports. Who's writing them? Why are they writing them? And, and is this like reading Shakespeare in the sixth grade for the first time when you're reading this? I mean, obviously, you speak Spanish well enough to to understand all the Spanish words. But language moves in 500 years. So talk about like the source material and then bring it back to how many people died and then like how quickly they all perished. Sure. Well, uh, we are very fortunate in that we have two very detailed sources for this expedition. Uh, so one of the survivors, Cabeza de Vaca, uh, again, I, I will skip ahead to the story. Yes. And he went back to Spain after this incredible ordeal lasting almost a decade. And he wrote... A, uh, you know, a report to the king or an account uh, meant for the king um, of everything that happened. And so that's one source. It was published in uh, Spain, and, and, you know, so therefore we have access to that. Right. It is, uh, I mean, it, it is relatively easy to understand. Okay. Uh, it's, um, and uh, except for several words, you know, there are some 16th century uh, words, et cetera, et cetera. But you really need to understand the, con the 16th century context uh, to really fully understand. So mm. for your listeners, if they really want to get to the real source, they can actually get, it's called Cabeza de Vaca, the account. Um, and, uh, and you can read that and you can really follow along with him uh, what happened. But in some moments, you, if you're not very well versed in 16th century Spanish history, you will not understand what's happening, why things are happening, et cetera. Uh, the other source is the so-called joint report, which is uh, in the end four survived, as I was saying. And uh, they were, they were when they were rescued, they took their depositions. Uh, three are Spaniards in commanding positions, and one is an African slave, which in many ways is the, who in many ways is the most interesting of the four as I will try to, uh, to describe to you. Uh, but nobody cared about what he had to say, even though he probably had the most interesting things to say about this whole expedition. But they took the joint testimony of these three surviving Spaniards. And so that's the other source. These two sources don't always match exactly, but they are consistent enough that we can uh, that we can kind of piece together the, the whole expedition. The other thing you say, you talk about in the book too, and I'm just going to jump in because it's important to get it now, the, uh, this is the one and only snapshot of pre-Columbian, what's left of pre-Columbian America slash Mexico. I mean, this is it, right? As you, as you just teased a second ago, the natives are, are dying almost as fast as, as these guys. How much uh, Spanish presence had these guys, if any, had they detected along their journey as they've got to all these areas? Yeah, I mean, they visited a lot of areas. And you're right in that even though you, whenever you're dealing with some of the early Spanish expeditions, when you scratch under the surface, you realize that other Spaniards had already been there before mm -hmm. in many instances, but not in this case. In this case, some people had already been to the Florida Peninsula before mm -hmm. Carlos Arabaca and his party, and Patio de Narvaez. But these individuals, as I will detail in a moment, will go deep into the heart of North America, and uh, nobody had ventured there before them. Mm -hmm. So they are so we are truly getting a first glimpse of 
America as it existed prior to the arrival of Europeans uh, yeah. from, from, from these expeditions. So everybody dies. How quickly does this expedition go so from it, 300? Well, I mean, so the, that first winter, so this whole hurricane uh, mm -hmm. event occurred in the, in, the, in the summer, then they walked through the fall, and then they are landing in the winter uh, on the coast of Texas. Yeah. And that first winter was devastating. Yeah. They could not adapt. They could not adapt to the cold. I mean, you can imagine. This is also, this is unfolding in the so-called little ice age. Oh, right. So temperatures were a lot colder than right. they are. And even today, I mean, you spend naked uh, a <laughs> yeah. full winter in the coast of Texas would be quite trying, but you right. can imagine a couple of degrees lower. Yeah, uh, that would have been really, really difficult, um, and without food, um, with very little food. So, uh, so they are eating crickets. They are eating wow. uh, whatever they are getting their hands on in order to endure until the summer, when they are, they have the hope of eating prickly pears. That's what the, I mean, that's one of the foods that the Indians tell them in the, wait until the summer and we're going to be, have our bellies full with prickly pear. And so that's what they are looking for. In this right. Time. Um, so that's, so that's what happened. They are separated, as I said, three Spaniards and one African. Um, all three Spaniards are uh, people in commanding positions. So the highest rank of all three of these Spanish is Cabeza de Vaca, who was the treasurer of the expedition. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he came from a family of conquistadors. His grandfather had participated in the conquest of Gran Canaria, one mm -hmm. of the Canary Islands. Um, uh, the other two Spaniards were uh, not quite as prominent, but nearly so. They were captains, you know, so they had a significant appointments in the expedition. And the fourth member, the most fascinating, was uh, was an African slave, uh, Esteban or Estebanico, as he's called in the narrative. He uh, came from the town of Asamor in what is now the coast of Morocco, uh -huh. uh, where the Portuguese had uh, that the Portuguese had taken Asamor earlier in the 16th century, and they had uh, established a thriving slave business, so they were taking people from Asamor to the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, some of them were sold in Seville, where the expedition departed from, and, you know, when uh, Pamphilo de Narvaez had fitted, uh, fitted his expedition, and, uh, and one of these uh, individuals purchased uh, Estebanico, who, uh, who, who had been enslaved now in three different continents. So, so he had been enslaved right. in Africa, yeah. he had been taken to Europe and experienced, uh, you know, slavery in Europe, in right. the Iberian Peninsula. And now, uh, as they are moving into the new world, they, these four individuals who started as guests, they, I guess they overstayed their welcome. Uh -huh. And they eventually went from guests to slaves. Yeah. Uh, so they were, uh, they were enslaved by the people and the the type of slavery again uh, they must you can imagine that they must have been a uh, burden on their indigenous saviors because mm -hmm. these were spaniards and an african who were laughably incapable of hunting or fishing in this environment who did not know how to use bows and arrows yeah. um, and so they basically were given women's work so they were assigned to carry wood. They were assigned to fetch water, um, to forage, to dig for roots until the, their fingers, uh, you know, bled. Um, so that's sort of the uh, the circumstances that they were, and they were they remained as slaves for a period of about six years wow. until they decided to they got together and they decided to plot their escape. Um, and while all of this is happening, uh, remarkable, and this is the final uh, transformation, um, they, uh, because they were so odd looking to the indigenous peoples, mm -hmm. they were asked and then forced to perform healings. Mm -hmm. 
because indigenous peoples believe that certain objects and certain peoples possessed uh, a special ability to manipulate the uh, spiritual and physical world. And because these, I mean, these three white people and these black people coming from an unimaginably distant place must have been, you know, possess some special yeah. uh, power. So they basically were forced to heal. They withdrew their food until they performed healings. And so Cabeza de Vaca says that, you know, we were very skeptical about this at first, but, you know, we had to eat. And so what we did is we, we prayed uh, fervently to God and hoping that through his help, we would bring some health to these individuals that were brought to us. Uh, what's what's really interesting so exactly what is happening is very difficult to know with mm -hmm. precision after 500 years after the fact right but we know that one of the three spanish survivors um alonso del castillo had was the son of a physician in spain so he would have had some and um, you know physicians back in the 16th century in spain had their practice in their homes so you can imagine that Alonso del Castillo growing yeah. up would have been very familiar with all the medical equipment available to his father, and he would have been very familiar with the patients and the procedures, the medical procedures. So he probably knew everything there was to know about medical science of Spain in the 16th century. And from what they describe, for example, uh, these, you know, the, the Spanish and the African slave, all four perform healings. They are presented with individuals who are wounded, for example, that they have an arrow, that they have an arrow. They have to pull out an mm -hmm. arrow, for example. And they describe what they do, and they describe how they clean the wound, and they describe how they uh, sew the wound. Um, so, so clearly some medical knowledge is implied in this. So it's not right. just... But uh, Cabeza de Vaca just says that, you know, we did it and it worked and we don't know why yeah uh and because of that their reputation started growing so uh so eventually they uh they make this incredible transformation from lowly slaves to these very influential healers who are being presented with with the ill and the sick right. in these different communities and eventually they are able to leave um, and they are able to go wherever they want or sort of wherever it wants. So basically a very curious system develops, a very yeah. extraordinary system develops. Um, and, and, and what is really amazing is that they want to get, they want to go south along the Gulf of Mexico coast in order to get to San Cristóbal del Puerto, which was their first ta their, their target to begin with. Yeah. At this point, they are not that <coughs> far from that. So from Tampa Bay, Florida, mm -hmm. they have, you know, done these, uh, you know, these barge trip all the way to the coast of Texas. And now they're walking further south and they're getting close to to the area directly south of Texas in Tamaulipas, what is now Tamaulipas, Mexico. Uh, and they decide that they are so secure and so powerful that they, instead of going back to the Spanish settlement, they uh, decide to go deep to go west and deep into the continent with the help of these indigenous followers and supporters. Mm -hmm. um, and so a system develops. So basically the the, the hosts keep the, the four castaways. They bring their ill, their, uh, their sick, and they feed them and give them water and take care of them, etc. And then when all of these healings are done, then they are ready to move on and then they say they where they want to go and uh and so the host indigenous peoples take them to the next village so to the next community and then uh the next community takes the the four castaways and uh allow themselves to be plundered by the previous hosts who take all the goods of the indigenous peoples who are now become the new hosts and the four castaways, or Cabeza de Vaca writes that he's quite alarmed by this uh, plundering. But the new hosts reassure them that it's no problem, that they are happy to give up their possessions 
in return for them, for having the, the powerful healers right. uh, amongst them. I, want to, I just want to see if I can back up and, and make sure I'm, I'm understanding everything you're saying, because even when I read it, I'm like, what? And I would have to back up. It's everybody, first off here, everybody needs to get the book. And so I'm going to put the link for the book right here. There it is. It's in the uh, it's in the remarks. Just it's a, it's an incredible tale. Um, so these guys become faith healers. And among the things they're doing to heal people is the sign of the cross and blowing on them. Now, there's other medical procedures they're doing and things, but they're doing like a, a performance. Now, how much, I mean, Cabeza de Vaca has to think that there's a God and he is like controlling all of this stuff. I mean, this is Greek mythology, like level, like the gods are messing with me, but now they, now you found the path and we're going to let you survive by blowing on people and wiping them down with, you know, whatever honey or whatever, whatever treatments they come up with. And so then each village of, of Indians transfer the healers to the next area and then the transfer the the losing tribe then plunders the gaining tribe mm -hmm. and then the healing begins and then the transfer begins and these guys are just walking across mexico and texas they're walking they go south from texas they cross into what is now again there are discussions about exactly right uh, their whereabouts because basically in the narrative you just say and we crossed for this river and we saw these mountains on the left and so Generations of scholars have argued over the identity of this river and those right. mountains, etc. But I, I read that he went through Boquias. We were in Boquias last year in Big Bend Park. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate, or is that just another like well, possible? Again, it's a possibility. Okay. All of this is uh, speculative. I mean, we will never know exactly unless we find archaeological evidence. Sure, right? sure. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of because there's nothing in Boquias, and it is hot. It is like hot, it's yeah. impossibly yeah. hot out Absolutely. there. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to say, one, yeah. come back to one thing that you mentioned, which is uh, Cabeza de Vaca himself never says that they were performing miracles right. for a particular reason. And that is that we learn about all of this from his account that he published. And in the 16th century, back in, back in that time, when somebody published a book, it had to be approved by the Inquisition. The Inquisition had to go over the manuscript and approve mm -hmm. it. And so invoking miracles would invite trouble with the Inquisition. And so Cabeza de Vaca very carefully avoids uh, talking about miracles or anything like that. Right. Uh, he just says that, you know, God somehow uh, helped us and, and through him, we were able to do healings, and there was not a single person who did not felt better after after our interventions, or so he says, right? Mm -hmm. So exactly what happened, or, I mean, this is Cabeza de Vaca's words after right. the fact. So again, yeah. we don't know exactly what happened. We also know that, uh, I mean, Cabeza de Vaca was married, as, as well as some other uh, members of the expedition. He never talked about sexual encounters with indigenous women, which we know from other evidence must have happened or could have happened. What evidence is that? Um, the African slave, for example, mm. demanded women as he moved from one town to another, for example. Got a boy. Um, so, um, and there's no reason to, serve, to suppose that the, that the Spanish men didn't as well. Right. But again, uh, this would have been bigamy in Spain, and sure. so there's not a single mention of that uh, in uh, in the accounts. Um, so uh, yeah, so 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 this is what's happening. Um, they amazingly they cross over the years. They cross uh, into what is now northern Mexico. They get all the way to what is probably La Junta de los Rios, or mm -hmm. you know, not far from El Paso. Right. Um, and they continue westward uh, all the way to what is now uh, northwestern Mexico. But not on the Baja side. Not on the Baja side, okay. south uh -huh. of Baja right. California. Okay. On the continent side. Gotcha, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, around Sonora and Sinaloa, that region. Right, okay. Um, and these are like deserts still in this time, right? Deserts, yeah. I mean, they, Cabeza de Vaca describes how the indigenous peoples, I mean, by then they are being followed by thousands 
thousands of followers, if you can imagine this, and they are carrying water over mm -hmm. the desert for themselves and to share with the four healers. Yeah. And they are, uh, and we know, again, that this is the first glimpse of this whole world because many of these uh, indigenous peoples are calling them the children of the sun. Yeah. Because they are so weird looking and they speak such weird languages that they have, have to have, have come from such unbelievably faraway places. What was their language capacity as they went along? Well, uh, again, that's why I think interviewing the African slaves Tabanico would have been the, 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 best, uh, the best alternative. So their setup must have been quite impressive because the three Spaniards stayed behind mm. while Estebanico conducted the negotiations. Apparently, mm. he was a very talented with languages, and he learned some of the indigenous languages right. as he's going through this. Uh, so, uh, so he was at least initially the, the guy uh, making contact and uh, negotiating where, where they were going to go and what was going to happen with some of the hosts. Right. So he probably knew better than the three Spaniards yeah. uh, what was happening. <laughs> and what are their provisions now? Like they're, they're, they're not starving, they've got water, but what do they have beyond sustenance? They have, uh, they describe uh, deer, meat, okay. venison. Uh, they have a lot of meat. I mean, these are, again, uh, they are now in a very different situation because they are with people who have lived there for thousands of years. So they are supremely adapted to the environment. They know mm -hmm. exactly what to forage, what to hunt, how to hunt it. Um, and so they have no problem with provisions. They have no problem with water. I mean, all their... Are they still making? They are wearing skins. Okay. But uh, when they... We, we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. They are practically naked. Yeah. And they are you know, found later on. Yeah. yeah. How long does this uh, faith healer uh, caravan, how long, how many years does that go on for? So this goes on for over two years. Okay. Uh, so again, it, it's hard to, well, or even more, it depends mm -hmm. because it's hard to know exactly when the healing began because it probably began shortly thereafter they are in captivity. Right. Because even though they are captives, they are also being forced to heal. Yeah. So again, it's difficult to tell exactly to answer your question with right. precision. But it's but as very powerful healers, you know, who are being, you know, taken with reverence from one place to another, probably a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would think just thinking about this, if you are the son of a doctor, probably going to go be a doctor yourself. You have the skill. You see something. He's got a rash. You're like, well, that's an agave. I know what to do with that. I'm going to rub on. You know, and it probably almost instantly becomes this is something valuable. And could keep us protected, you know. I would think. Sure, right, 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 right. I mean, these were all smart individuals. I mean, right. They were survivors out of three hundred. Right. These four survived, so yeah. uh, they must have had a lot going going forward. And they survived not by sheer of their weapons, or their superior weapons, or their horses. They they survived by their wits. Yeah. Um, Was the uh, the transfer of the disease from the Spaniards uh, to the natives? Was that constant? Were they always seeing that? Were they was the patient was the doctor making the patient sick? We don't know. We don't know. Uh, so again, there are these descriptions of, especially initially in the coast of Texas, of these uh, large, you know, uh, this mega death occurring unfolding right. amongst the indigenous population. They get blamed for it. Uh, later on, we we don't have any mention of such instances. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I can't answer that. Okay, so they get to the west coast, not Baja, but the west coast of, of Continental River, Mexico, however you refer to it, not Baja, no. on the coast. Um, and then what happens? So then uh, they, so unbeknownst to, while all of this is going on, uh, parties from central Mexico are moving northward. They are exploring uh, that western coast of Mexico they are finding uh, precious metals there, um, and uh, and so they want to. And, and so, in in particular, there is a very ruthless uh, Spanish conquistador, Nuno de Guzmán. He really seemed to be 
ruthless even amongst conquistadors. Um, uh, and so he, uh, he and his party just moved north from there. And so by the time Cabeza de Vaca reaches this region, he starts getting hints that there are uh, other Europeans in the area. So the, you know, his indigenous hosts are telling him that there are other Europeans in, in, in the area. And so uh, Cabeza de Vaca uh, moves forward, presses forward to finally come in, in contact with these other Europeans. It is also interesting because even though Estebanico had been a slave in Europe, in the course of these incredible, uh, you know, experiences in the in the Americas, he becomes something like another partner. He becomes like a, yeah. like a fourth member of the surviving band. Yeah, and, you know, fourth healer. Uh, but then, when close to the presence of other Europeans, he gets demoted again. Uh -huh. and so Cabeza de Vaca simply writes that, and I took the black man with me. So he again goes back to being a slave. Yeah, and we walked ahead. With our with our indigenous guides um, to try to encounter these Europeans, these Europeans are as enslaving Indians uh, in the area. That's they are exploring, but one of the businesses they have is that they are rounding up men, women, and children. Mm -hmm. And so that's the party that the that the Cabeza de Vaca and Estebanico first meet. And, uh, and Cabeza de Vaca writes about it in, in very lyrical, very poetic ways. He says that, you know, and they saw us from afar and, uh, you know, they, they must have been completely unfounded because here, here they have, they were seeing, so here you have this cavalry detachment, Spanish yeah. cavalry detachment out there in the, in the boonies in the middle of nowhere where they are just expecting other Native Americans, you know, prey uh, to be in and around. And then out in the distance, they see this black guy and this white guy with a beard going down to his chest, long hair, uh, you know, uh, skin uh, peeling. Mm -hmm. And uh, and as they come come close, they realize that you know these are really weird people to be coming from the interior of North America. Yeah. And then they are completely taken aback when Cabeza de Vaca addresses them in perfect Spanish in their own language. And he demands to know what the time of the what the date is at that point. Right. Uh, and uh, and they couldn't answer the, I mean they were so surprised by this whole thing and Cabeza de Vaca goes on to tell that please take me to your commander um, and uh, you know and so they uh, that's how the the story ends but there's a more dramatic end because the the slavers who were having trouble finding slaves now are really excited because they can enslave the companions to Cabeza de Vaca and the others. Yeah. And they were upwards of a thousand Indians. So here you have a huge uh, cache of Indians that could be enslaved. And so there's a showdown between Cabeza de Vaca and the others. And the Indians themselves don't want to leave Cabeza de Vaca and the others, exposing themselves to great danger. And, and Cabeza de Vaca tells us that they could not believe that we were of the same nation, that the slavers and Cabeza de Vaca and the other castaways were of the same nation. Because they said uh, the, the, the castaways were naked and the, the others were, you know, clad in armor and right. fully armed. And uh, Cabeza de Vaca and the other castaways were healing people and these other people were killing people. And so they seemed completely different uh, to be of the same nation. Uh, so, uh, so that's how these, uh, this this uh, story ends. Um, in the end, you know, they reach an agreement uh, in this showdown. But of course, the slaving business continues. Of course, uh, yeah. you know, it continues for centuries. Uh, but uh, Cabeza de Vaca uh, finally returns to Mexico City, uh, or I mean, gets to Mexico City. They, he had never, he had not been there before. Um, and where he causes a sensation. Obviously, the the viceroy of Mexico City uh, is delighted to hear about this expedition that they thought had been lost. I mean, by then, uh, a decade has passed, right. and everybody assumes that everybody died of this Florida expedition. And here you have these guys coming from the other coast, uh, 
right. claiming to have visited the entire yes. north. Uh, so they must have had incredible information about a region that other Spaniards were only beginning to explore. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, even a generation later or two, they remembered, for example, seeing Cabez or their, you know, the parents, the four, the, the, you know, the descendants remember their parents seeing Cabeza de Vaca naked in a church. So they were taken to the church, for example, to be shown naked as they would with the, you know, you know when they were walking in yeah. North America. So, uh, so clearly, uh, you know, uh, uh, an incredible story that ended there. Did the uh, the nature of the healing evolve at all? Like, did it become, uh, I don't want to say, like more evangelical or like Pentecostal or like, we got snakes and they're doing all kinds of things? Or did they keep it pretty simple, does it seem? Pretty simple. Uh, they themselves, as I said, uh, again, what we, the texts that we get are going to be scrutinized by the sure, organization. Right, so right. they don't really want to go there. Right. Uh, but what's really interesting is that uh, later, Spanish chroniclers and men of letter of the 17th and 18th century, of course, knew about this extraordinary uh, adventure, and they began embellish, embellishing mm -hmm. what happened, mm -hmm. and they cast Cabeza de Vaca as a sort of a Jesus Christ who is performing miracles right. against the uh, Indians of the interior of North America. Yeah, and so uh, and so the story itself later on becomes embellished and becomes full of religious meaning later on. And are there, are there any private letters that he exchanges with his friends and like, I mean, I was doing miracles left and right. I mean, I don't know what, you know, I mean, is there, was he ever, did he ever let his hair down and let, you know? No, uh, he, um, he was very excited about uh, what he had accomplished that because Spain was at the time, uh, taking different parts of the new world mm -hmm. as conquests. And he had shown that there was another way to do this in collaboration with indigenous people rather than taking right. over their lands and their food and enslaving them. Um, and so he went back to Spain, Carlos de Vaca, after this experience, went back to Spain, had an audience with the king, and wanted to petition that same region as his own instead of going as a treasurer, he wanted to go as the main person, as Panfilo de Narvaez, right. um, to secure that, uh, that grant. Uh, and so he knew, he, and you know, his argument was a very powerful one, that he already had a working relationship with the people there and that they were willing to work with him and that this could be done peacefully uh, and very productively for both parties involved. Uh, but uh, as it turned out, uh, the that grant had already been given away to De Soto, another mm -hmm. well-known figure in American history. Uh, and he didn't want to go back with De Soto as treasurer as he had done because he, he didn't want to repeat the same expedition. So he, he spent years in the Spanish court pursuing some other uh, region where he could become a, some, you know, become a main uh, colonizer. Yeah. And he ended up going to South America. I know you got to go, so I want to wrap this up real quick. But um, what are you working on? So first, I'd like to talk to you for another hour about this. I have sure. so many questions, but we got to wrap it up. You got to get on an airplane. Uh, what are you working on now? Because you're here amongst all these archives, and you're sure. always bringing these great stories. Sure. Well, um, my previous book is about the first expedition that went from the Americas to Asia and back. And so what I'm doing here is the follow-up to that, which is... Mm. Uh, what were what was the consequence of these regular trans-Pacific contact that was established mm -hmm. from the middle of the 16th century all the way to the to the 19th century? So, right. uh, so uh, an incredible trading route, one of the greatest greatest trading routes in the world, and that of course took um, highly productive American plants to Asia, thus transforming the population and the way of life there. And uh, Asians demanding, especially Chinese demanding silver from the New World and then transforming the New World, right. creating uh, this uh, empire of silver in the oh. New World. So that's the project that I'm trying to, uh, to work on here. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show. I, I, I have more questions, but I know we got to go. So we got to just do another show another time. But uh, thank you very much for coming on. And anything in closing? Pete, thank you so much for uh, this opportunity. And uh, it's always a pleasure to chat with you.
Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly. Thank you so 